In this video, we're going to talk about one of my favorite kinds of cases to do in the office, and that is the removal of third molars that are fully impacted in a patient who's about 16 to 17 years old, where we've got around 50% root development, more or less. Our patient for this case is a healthy 16-year-old young man who recently completed his orthodontic treatment and is now presenting for removal of his wisdom teeth on referral from his orthodontist. As you can see from the panoramic radiograph, he has four full bony impacted third molar teeth that uh, are fairly close to the surface and show maybe about 20% development of their roots. These teeth have been completely asymptomatic, but as you can see from the radiograph, there's absolutely no way that these are going to come in to be in function and able to be maintained by the patient. So we know at some point they are going to become problematic, and it's much better to do it while the patient is young and healthy and before the roots fully develop, rather than waiting until the patient gets older when the surgery will be more complicated and recovery more difficult. Since his impactions are fairly symmetrical and uh, we can get a much better camera angle from the right side, we're actually going to show in this video removal of tooth number 1 and 32 only. Before we get into the procedure, let's talk about what my pre-op preparation is for the patient. First of all, when I have four full bony impacted wisdom teeth, or even four wisdom teeth period, I uh, generally do this under general anesthetic. It just makes the patient uh, a lot more comfortable. It's a much, enjoy much more enjoyable experience for them, and I can get my job done much more efficiently and uh, quickly. So uh, if that's available to you, I would highly recommend uh, getting some training in IV sedation or having an anesthesiologist come into your office when you're doing a case like this. Uh, as far as preparation, if the patient's basically healthy, really the only thing I have them do other than uh, come NPO and with a ride is to start rinsing with chlorhexidine rinse, uh, the 0.12% rinse twice a day starting two days before the surgery. This has been shown to reduce the infection rate and also the rate of dry socket. Uh, I don't put the patient on empirical antibiotics. i uh, found that that really does not reduce the uh, post-op infection rate very significantly. and uh, uh, it can lead to problems such as development of antibiotic resistance or uh, making a true infection if it develops more problematic. So let's take a look at tooth number 32. As you can see, it is a mesioangular full bony impaction. You can see from the arrows I've indicated that there is bone visible uh, completely around the coronal portion of the tooth. Uh, for coating purposes, if we can see bone over about 75% of the tooth, we'll consider that a full bony because once you get in there clinically, you'll find that where the bone uh, does not appear radiographically is actually present but very thin. So 75% bone coverage or more makes it a full bony impaction. Taking a look at the roots, you can see that there's minimal root development. I would say probably about 20% in this case. Also, we're fairly close to the mandibular canal, but it's uh, just barely touching it and not crossing it. You could get a cone beam CT scan if you wanted to get a little more accurate uh, look of the relationship between the two, but I think in this case it's uh, probably not indicated. So let's take a look here at our surgical site for number 32. As you can see, it's completely covered by healthy mucosa. We're going to uh, begin our access to this tooth by making a sulcular incision, which we're going to begin uh, around the distal, uh, distal buccal line angle area of the first molar, carry it through the papilla uh, between the first and second molar, and then posteriorly onto the retromolar region. We need to be conscious of the buccolingual positioning of the distal extension of our incision over the tooth uh, because of the variability of the lingual nerve. We want to make sure that we are no more lingual than the central groove of the second molar tooth. We begin by placing a throw pack and retractors in order to isolate the area. Uh, we're going to begin our incision on the uh, retromolar area over tooth number 32 with a sharp number 15 blade, and then begin our sulcular incision at the distobuccal line angle of tooth number 30. We're going to carry that distally and then connect the two. It's important to use a sharp blade when we're doing this as the tissue is quite thick and carry it all the way down to bone. If I'm doing a bilateral case, I'll actually use a fresh blade for each side. Next, we're going to do a uh, lay a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap with a molt periosteal elevator, as you can see here. Uh, again, it's important that the sharp end of the molt periosteal be used and it go all the way down to bone so that you are getting underneath the periosteal layer and uh, reflecting that uh, atraumatically or as atraumatically as possible. Sometimes it's a little difficult to do, uh, but uh, you need to use a sharp end. Once we've fully reflected that full thickness mucoperiosteal flap, we then need to 
uh, get access to the tooth in order to remove it. And we do that by removing the next layer, which is the bone. We're going to use our surgical handpiece to sweep away the bone that's covering the tooth. And if we look at this radiographically, the bone we're going to need to remove is on the occlusal aspect of the tooth, but also extending onto the distal and mesial regions so that we can completely see the crown. Now, because this tooth, tooth is mesoangular and not quite as vertical, uh, in order to get the tooth out, since it won't come out in one piece, we're going to have to bisect the crown, uh, and then that bisection is going to carry down through the roots so that we can take out the tooth in two individual pieces. So we now begin our procedure using a straight surgical handpiece. In this case, I'm using a 702 straight fissure burr with lots and lots of irrigation and kind of using the burr as a paintbrush, just painting away uh, lightly uh, with very light pressure, just painting away the bone that's covering uh, tooth number 32. So I'm going to go over the full extent of where the tooth is hiding. Um, as I start sweeping away the bone, I will begin to see the tooth and that will help me uh, uh, as far as where I'm going to be further removing the bone. I'm using a very light stroke, a very light uh, uh, pressure, and once I've found the uh, margins or the border of the crown, I'm going to be sweeping away bone, as you can see there, uh, on the uh, buccal aspect and a little bit onto the mesial, uh, basically creating what we call a trough. So this trough is going to be carried all the way around uh, the tooth on the buccal, a little bit on the mesial, and then distally we're only going to go as far as the central groove of the third molar, uh, and that's why it's important to have good visualization because any more lingual to that we risk injuring the lingual plate and the lingual nerve. So we're now going to, uh, once we've exposed it, we look for the furcation. We're going to bisect the crown. We only allow our bird to go as deep as two-thirds the width of the crown and the roots. We don't want to go too far lingually, otherwise again we're going to risk injuring the lingual plate and possibly the uh, lingual nerve as it's passing by the lingual plate. So that's real important that we're very aware of where our burr is so that we can uh, avoid injury to the lingual nerve. We're then going to split the tooth using a 46R elevator that's going to go into the frication. We're going to give it a rotation. And the idea here is to uh, split the tooth, rotate the distal half out, uh, take that out surgically. So with the elevator, we now take out the distal uh, half of the tooth. And then we're going to do the same thing with the 46R elevator into that little mesial pocket that we created, a mesial trough, and place the elevator into there, and then very easily rotate uh, the mesial half of the uh, tooth, uh, crown, and roots out of the socket. And we can go ahead and then grab that with a hemostat. And you can see there's some follicle attached, there's some follicular tissue in there. And then we're going to use our molt curette, a uh, curved molt curette, to thoroughly curette out the socket. We want to remove all remnants or as much as we possibly can of the uh, follicular tissue. We don't have to get every last scrap, uh, but uh, you don't want to, you want to remove at least the majority of it. Uh, now, once we've got all the follicle out, we're going to use a bone file to smooth the bony edges so there's no uh, splinters or rough edges to irritate the patient and no uh, uh, bone splinters that can possibly sequester and create an infection. So we do the bone file uh, with lots and lots of irrigation to get all the debris out and then we're going to go ahead and close our incision. Uh, for suturing, I basically just suture between uh, the first and second molar and the interdental papilla using a 3-0 gut suture. Just a simple interrupted suture is all we need. Uh, very simple to place. Uh, you want to make sure that you're through the papilla on the buccal and the lingual. You want to be careful not to go too deep, too inferiorly on the lingual because again uh, you risk injury to the lingual nerve which has a very variable position. You can, if you like, add another suture back here, but it really doesn't make much of a difference as far as healing, and it does, again, risk injury to the lingual nerve. Okay, so now we'll take a look at tooth number one, which you can also see is a full bony impaction with bone completely surrounding the tooth. Again, there's minimal root development. I'd say probably about 10% root development altogether on this tooth. Most likely we're going to need to use a handpiece to remove bone rather than just flicking it away with a periosteal elevator. The other thing that we're going to have to be uh, conscious of is this tooth is very close to the maxillary sinus and there's a good likelihood that when we take the tooth out that there's going to be a very thin layer of bone, uh, possibly less than an eggshell thickness between the extraction socket and the uh, maxillary sinus. So we've got to be aware of the possibility that this patient may develop an oral antral fistula right at surgery or sometimes uh, postoperatively.
So here's where tooth number one is clinically, and we're going to make our incision. Again, it's going to be a sulcular incision beginning around the middle of the uh, first molar carried into the interdental papilla and the sulcus, and then onto the uh, maxillary tuberosity. Uh, so we're going to make sure we have good visualization. We're going to start with our sharp uh, blade again, and we're going to incise uh, full thickness through the tissue in the tuberosity area, carry that uh, deeply within the sulcus. We want to make sure that our blade goes as far down as possible, all the way down to bone, so that we're again elevating a full thickness mucoperiosteal flap. And we're going back to make sure that the incision is deep enough, and then we can use our molt periosteal elevator, uh, which you saw previously, to reflect our flap. Again, we're using the pointed end, not the rounded end, of the molt number nine periosteal elevator. We're stripping off the periosteum. We want to have full visualization of our surgical site so we can uh, do the most atraumatic surgery possible. The bone in this area is fairly thin and uh, at least overlying uh, the occlusal aspect of the tooth so we're able to flake some of it away with the sharp end of the periosteal elevator. This gives us a little bit better visualization uh, for bone removal with the burr. So what we're going to do with our burr is we're going to remove the bone that's overlying the occlusal area and a little bit onto the buckle. Uh, so that we can see the tooth completely. So again, this is a straight surgical handpiece with a 702 fissure burr, which we're using just like we did in the mandible to very gently paint away the bone that's overlying the occlusal aspect of the tooth and the buckle. We're going to go a little bit mesially uh, to the mesial buckle uh, line angle of the tooth because that's where we're going to be placing our uh, 46R elevator. Again, we do this with lots and lots of copious irrigation. Uh, we don't want to burn the bone. We want to keep the bone as cool as possible, and that'll minimize the patient having any post-op discomfort and uh, post-op risk of infection. Once we've made a clear path for removal of the tooth, we can come in with our 46R elevator and uh, elevate the tooth out of the socket. Here's where we want to place our elevator on the mesial of tooth number one, and then we want to use our elevator to rotate the tooth out distally and buccally so that it can be removed. So here, uh, clinically, you can see the 46R elevator in place, and we're going to uh, uh, find a good purchase point, and then we can rotate the elevator. This moves the tooth distally and buccally out of the socket so that we can then grab it with a curved hemostat and uh, remove it from the mouth. In this case, we're lucky enough that the follicular tissue is uh, still attached to the tooth. So then we can come in with our molt double-ended spoon curette, which you again saw earlier, and we want to thoroughly debride out the uh, extraction socket, make sure we've gotten all of the follicular tissue or as much as we can out of it. Uh, use a combination of that curved curette with a mosquito hemostat to grab all the tissue. Uh, finally, we're going to take our bone file again and smooth off any rough edges. This is done under copious irrigation because we don't want to leave any uh, splinters that could possibly sequester off and create an infection or be an irritation to the patient. Most of the time, this tissue will lay uh, very nicely by itself and the cheek will hold it in place, so it's not really necessary to put a suture for the majority of maxillary impacted third molar teeth. As far as my post-operative care regimen for the patient, we have them not rinse uh, at all on the day of surgery, but beginning the next morning with the chlorhexidine rinse again twice a day until it's gone, which should be 14 days if they use it properly, and also warm salt water rinses as much as they'd like. Uh, for prescriptions, I give them a narcotic pain medication, most commonly the Vicodin, the 5300 strength. Uh, but I tell them the most important thing they need to do is to, as soon as they get some food in their stomach, to start on a regimen of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory around the clock for the first few days. Generally, I tell them uh, ibuprofen, 600 milligrams, about every six to eight hours, and that will really significantly reduce the amount of swelling and stiffness that they have. Also, it minimizes the need for the that narcotic pain medication. Also something that's very important is for the patient to uh, apply ice to the areas of surgery about 20 minutes on and off. This has a significant effect on reducing their post-operative swelling and uh, resultant discomfort. Uh, we have them do that for just for the first 24 hours or so. The patients are scheduled for their first post-op visit at one week, although they're told if they have any uh, problems or concerns, they can give us a call and we can get them in sooner if uh, need be. Uh, 
but uh, generally the routine is one week. Also, at the one week follow-up, we go over hygiene instructions, including giving them an irrigating syringe to clean out and uh, irrigate the lower third molar sockets. We don't give it to them at the time of surgery. For one thing, they're legally drunk when they leave the office and aren't going to remember how to do it properly. But we've also found that if we give it to them at surgery, they start using it too soon. And we want to be sure that the patient leaves the extraction socket alone, uh, at least for the first three or four days, to minimize the risk of uh, flushing out the, the clot and creating a dry socket.